All right. Thanks again, everyone, for joining and for hanging in for a second so that folks have a chance to get their Zoom fired up for the day. Um, we are talking about annotate, collaborate, and elevate today. And what my kind of main goals are, are to give you ideas for how you can use hypothesis social annotation in your courses this term. So what is that roadmap going to look like for the day? Um, oh, my timer has decided to start again. I'll start by kind of giving us an intro of what hypothesis social annotation is for those of us who have never used that before. And we will get into why you might want to use social annotation in your courses. Then we'll look at some ways that you can guide student annotations. What are some different ideas for how to prompt students to socially annotate? Uh, and we'll look at that through the specific lenses of annotating to reach all types of learners. And additionally, annotating to kind of combat the use of AI in our courses or maybe increase AI literacy in our courses, which I know has been a big concern amongst educators throughout, um, I don't know, everywhere. Uh, and then I'll leave you with some resources for getting started. So our session today is really going to be more pedagogically focused than technically focused. I will, like I said, show you what it looks like to annotate in Hypothesis, but I will not go over how to get set up in your learning management system because we have folks here joining from lots of different learning management systems. Uh, so at the end of the session, I will give you resources on how you can find that information or how you can get in touch with someone who will help you with getting set up in your learning management system. Um, so I want to start out by kind of seeing uh, what folks experience with hypothesis is. So before I get into what it looks like to annotate with hypothesis, uh, if you could take the poll that I am about to launch and let me know if you've used hypothesis before, that'll give me a sense of how many people are new to using hypothesis and how many people are more experienced. And as uh, we go through the session today, please feel free to put Question, uh, your Q&A in the Q&A function. So if you have questions, if you have thoughts, you can always pop them into that q and I'll be checking the Q&A throughout our session uh, to see what other questions that people might have. So I'll wait a little bit longer. It looks like most people have answered the poll. All right. Thank you all for taking the poll. It looks like we have about 60% of people here have never used hypothesis before. And then our remaining about 40%, I'm rounding here, um, have used it to some extent. So I will start us off by looking at what social annotation with hypothesis is, since lots of people have not used the tool before and some of us aren't sure what it does. I think that's an important first question to answer. Um, so I apologize if I'm looking over into like the nothingness over here, it's because I have another screen over here where I have hypothesis pulled up. So um, that is why I'm looking into the nothingness. Uh, so to start out, I want to just look at a reading that I have pulled up in my um from my learning management system. So I've already opened this from Canvas in this example, but Hypothesis will look similar whether you're using Canvas or another learning management system like Brightspace, Blackboard, or Moodle. Um, so in this case, I have a chapter of a um, an open educational resource textbook. So in this case, it's just a physics, a free physics chapter that's available uh, you know, online for students to access. I've loaded that into my learning management system for students to review. And what Hypothesis is letting me do is it's adding this sidebar along the right-hand side of the learning management system. So Hypothesis is essentially taking this sidebar and overlaying it on the reading that my students are doing. And th that is a space where students can have a conversation about their text as they're reading it. Uh, so they can ask questions, they can add comments, uh, and it, reading becomes a collaborative activity where all the students can see each other's annotations and me as the instructor of I added annotations, they can see them as well. So I'll note a couple of things here. You might notice that along the left-hand side of the text, we have different areas that are 
highlighted. So some parts of the text have these highlights and these highlights are connected to annotations on the right-hand side. So as I hover over each annotation on the right-hand side, the highlighted text will change color. So that shows me exactly what word or phrase or sentence a student has just decided to highlight or me as the instructor has decided to make a comment on. And that text is also quoted within that highlighted area in the annotation. Um, so you can choose sp very specifically, you know, a, like I said, a word or a phrase or a sentence and add a comment or add a question around that specific area of text. So in this example, for instance, um, Jennifer has annotated a, an equation as kind of writing out the syntax of an equation. Uh, and you'll notice that this annotation specifically, as well as some others, have the ability to show replies. So if I click on this show reply function, um, it'll expand a threaded discussion. And this threaded discussion is a discussion that's happening amongst students. So the student Malika is replying to Jennifer's annotation about this equation. And she's asking, why is potential energy represented differently on both sides of the equation? Now, if I were a physics instructor, which I am not, um, I could come in and answer that question. I could reply and add an answer so that everybody in the class could see it. I, or I could see if maybe another student could answer that. Um, I'm not a physics instructor though, so I don't know the answer. So I'm gonna leave that one unanswered. Um, but if I scroll down even further, I'll show you just another example. And in this example, uh, Jennifer is annotating the law of conservation of momentum. and the textbook does a really bad job of defining the law of conservation of momentum in this particular example. And so she is kind of rewriting it to like be like, you know, am I understanding this? And if I click the show replies function here, you'll see Malika has responded with a video saying, hey, I think this video could be really helpful in understanding the law of conservation of momentum. So these same two students are having these kind of two separate conversations about the text uh, and ask, asking and answering questions together about the text as they're reading the text. Uh, and we have a multimedia feature here, which kind of, if we put a pin in, I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but uh, it's very easy to add comments as we're completing the reading with Hypothesis. So if I scroll down and I wanted to add something to the text here, I would select the text that I'd like to annotate. I can click on the annotate button. I could add a question or a comment here, click post, and then continue on with my reading. And this is really why a hypothesis, although we have features that are similar to a discussion board, like that threaded discussion feature, why it's very different from a threaded discussion board, because the annotations are specifically anchored to these pieces of text and things that students can do as they complete their reading. So it's not these two separate activities uh, where a student is reading in isolation and then going to a discussion board or a reflection activity and doing those things as a completely separate and second activity to the reading. They are reading and reflecting kind of all at once. Um, and that makes the conversation, in my experience, more authentic. And we are integrated with all of the major learning management systems like Canvas, Blackboard, Brightspace, Moodle, and Sakai, um, as well as a couple others. And the way that Hypothesis works is that everything that you would typically do in your learning management system, like set up an assignment, or grade, you're still doing that in your learning management system. So we are not sending you to another third-party website to um, you know, do your grading or to create your assignment or anything. Everything is done within your learning management system, which makes the setup a little bit easier. Um, so I see a couple of questions coming up into the Q&A, um, and I have another poll for you all. Um, so I'm going to put that poll out there and, uh, see what's going on in the Q and A here. Um, so let me find my polls again. And I'm going to see if, you know, you're having students reading in your course, 
Um, my next poll is to figure out what you kind of struggle with the most with students doing the reading or really looking at any course documents. Um, so figuring out what your goals with hypothesis might be. So I'm going to launch that now. If you could take my polls, I'm going to explore our Q&A. Okay, so we have some good questions in the Q&A that I think are um, an interesting thing to address for now. Um, and I will give folks another second to answer the poll before I get into that because um, I don't want to ask people to enter the poll and listen at the same time. Because apparently, even though we all try to multitask, we're very bad at it. Okay, looks like the poll answers have started to get a little bit slower in coming in. So I'm going to stop that for now and uh, look at some of the questions. So someone asked, wouldn't the annotation panel get really cluttered, especially in a larger class? And would this be off-putting who will have to plow through a long chain of comments? That's a good question. So the default setting in mo the majority of our learning management systems is that everyone can see each other's annotations. But you're right that in a really large class, this could be um, very difficult to keep up with, uh, with um, Lots of students commenting. You can see this document's already getting a little cluttered. With most learning management systems, we do work with your group sets. So in most learning management systems, you can create smaller groups for students to annotate in. So if you want to restrict groups to annotating in sets of 10 or something like that, you could do that and make it a little bit less cluttered. Um, we also have the ability to uh, turn off the highlights as you're reading and toggle the annotation sidebar and hide that to make the reading experience more focused. Um, so that is another feature that can help make the experience um, more focused as well. Uh, so hopefully that can address that question. I'm not sure what uh, Papuli is. That's another question in the Q&A. So if you want to provide a little bit more context around that, I might be able to answer that. Another question asks, how is this different from a shared Google Doc? Um, that is another good question. Um, the key difference here, I think, is the way that we integrate into the learning management system makes it easier to grade the annotations and filter by student a lot of times. Um, and also, the students have the capability of adding multimedia into annotations, which we'll look at a little bit later on, and it's not possible in Google Docs. We will talk about later on what materials are compatible with Hypothesis. So we'll get into that later. We'll put a pin on that question. Um, and then it looks like uh, lots of other people are um, asking questions. And some of these I am going to kind of put a pin in for later because it will make more sense for me to answer later, like the ideal number annotating a document, how much time is vested in grading, um, things like that might make sense to bring up later. Um, how do students learn to operate hypothesis? We actually have a YouTube video that I can share that uh, students can get started with um, and that uh, we can share that in the chat as well. Um, and someone asked, can you annotate a video? We'll be talking about the things that you can annotate a little bit later on too. Yes, but short answer, uh, yes. All right, thanks for the questions all. Before I get to the other questions and dive in a little bit more, I just want to also introduce myself. My name is Christy DeCarolis. I'm a customer success manager here at Hypothesis. So I do work with a lot of faculty and have been supporting faculty in ed tech tools um, for about 10 years. And I also use Hypothesis in my own teaching. So some of the things I'll bring up in the presentation today, I've done with my own students. I've graded Hypothesis. So some of the ways I'll answer these questions will be drawn from my own experiences too, in addition to working with lots of other faculty. Um, so it looks like the poll that I asked here, uh, it looks like I'll share the results so you can all see that. 
but most folks are struggling with just knowing whether or not their students have done the reading and figuring out what they most and least understood in the reading, in addition to getting students to discuss the reading actively in class. Um, and all these things I think hypothesis can really help with, and we'll touch on those things and tie them back to these goals as we move through the session today. All right, so the next few slides, I'm going to focus on why you might want to use social annotation in your courses. Um, so we, I have a few different reasons why I think that you can use social annotation in your courses and how it can help with student success. And some of these, I'll look at some case studies and research studies that will back these things up. Um, so the first thing is to encourage metacognition uh, um, with our students. So metacognition, understanding you know, our own thinking about our thinking is a really important skill for students to develop and enhances their retention and comprehension in you know, looking at the course readings and the course materials. Um, oftentimes, our students are not explicitly taught how to engage in metacognition or how to actively read a text. Uh, before they come into college. So hypothesis can really help us kind of force students into metacognition without even really like telling them that's what we're doing, right? So asking students to annotate as they read is asking students to think, what kind of questions do I have about this? Um, what, it, how is this connected to other things we've already learned in this class? How is this connected to things that I have learned in my own life or my own life experiences. So they have to think about those things in order to add the annotations to the document. So we're kind of forcing students to engage in metacognition. And that, again, can help with the retention and comprehension of the text. It can help prolong reading engagement. And I'll tell you what that means in just a moment, but essentially make sure our students are doing the reading throughout the semester. And more clearly identify student confusions. So a lot of you said you weren't sure in the poll what students do or do not understand when they're reading. And because students can really specifically select a certain you know, phrase or a sentence or something in the text as they annotate and read, they can ask a question about what they don't understand. And that can inform our teaching practices and let us know exactly what students are understanding or not understanding. Or we may glean that information based on how they're interpreting the text and how they're adding a comment. So I know I've had a lot of experiences where students have annotated something, um, like added a definition to a word that they didn't know or something like that. And it wasn't something that was even on my radar. So that can be really helpful as just providing information as well. So at UT Austin, we did a case study with them uh, somewhat recently, and we found that using hypothesis helps students stay engaged throughout a semester. Uh, so we looked at two physics courses that were using the same textbook with hypothesis. And one was using hypothesis and one course was not using hypothesis. So the course that was using hypothesis, uh, the average number of time that the e-texts are open a semester were seven days, seven median days active when they were not using hypothesis versus 36 median days active when they are. And um, you can't see in this chart, but I believe it's on the case study page that was just linked in the chat. The activity throughout the semester is sustained more when the students are using hypothesis. So a lot of times we see student engagement with the course text. You know, our students doing the reading that tends to drop off after the first month of classes. We probably just know this from our conversations with students, right? And um, with hypothesis, students will stay engaged, stay reading longer in the semester if you are asking them to socially annotate the text. Some other benefits to using social annotation in your class is to provide space for lots of different types of student voices. So we all know in our um, live classes, in any synchronous kind of class, whether that is on Zoom or face to face, we tend to get a very similar group of students that are raising their hand or that are participating in class. Um, 
Hypothesis gives folks an alternative way to engage with the reading. So if they are not comfortable speaking up in class, they can add their annotations and participate in that way, or maybe kind of warm their self, themselves up for participating more actively in class. So I know a lot of you mentioned in the poll too, getting students to actively engage in the course discussion can be a challenge. And I have been there, you know, when you're like asking a question in front of the class and you're just getting crickets in response. It's not a great feeling to just be like waiting there and no one is saying anything. Um, but with annotations, if you have students annotate before they come to class, you can actually just bring up the annotations in class and use that to kind of warm call the students in. So, you know, referencing the annotations and saying things like, oh, Javier, I noticed that you said X, Y, and Z in your annotation. Can you elaborate on what you meant by that a little bit more? Or um, I, I noticed that there was a question about this topic. Does someone else know the answer? You can see who has actually done the reading because they've added the annotations to hypothesis and more confidently bring them into that class discussion to make it more active. Uh, so that helps us anchor those class discussions as well. Uh, and this is just another kind of older, a little bit older research study that shows that students enjoy engaging with hypothesis too. Um, over 70% of students say that helps them learn, it helps them feel connected and work through their ideas together. And this will be important when we talk about using annotation to reach all students and kind of building our confidence um, amongst different kinds of students as well. Um, so the one thing I want to talk about now, and then I will kind of look at some of the Q&A that we have posted again, uh, is how to best guide student annotations. Because I have found that most of my students, at least in my experience, tend to be okay with using hypothesis technically, but how to engage with a document meaningfully can sometimes be more challenging for them. So they might add an annotation that doesn't lead to an engaging conversation or isn't really adding anything to the text. You know, we don't want them to say something like, oh, I agree with this point or summarize what the author is say, saying. Um, so how can we better guide our student annotations? How can we structure our hypothesis assignments in order to better ensure that our annotations lead to these more engaging conversations? This is what this will kind of focus on and hopefully give you some concrete ideas on how you can use hypothesis in your courses. So the first thing I like to talk about with folks whenever I'm working with an individual faculty member to think about how they might want to use hypothesis in their course is to ask them, what is your purpose for using social annotation? So everyone is going to have a different reason for using it. And we saw with the poll um, earlier that some people want to use it to hold students accountable for reading. So you might set up your hypothesis enabled readings with different instructions than someone who wants to create a more engaging class discussion or wants to build community in their classes. So our goals for social annotation can impact how we prompt our students or how we set up our assignments. So I'd really think about what you're hoping to get out of the annotations before we start creating instructions. Um, and some of the things that might be involved in this include how frequently you think students might annotate, how big your class is and what your class modality is, um, and then the types and the lengths of the readings as well. So your assignment frequency might depend on like if someone asked about how much time is invested in the grading of all of this. So if you have a, a class of 100 students, um, that could be a lot of grading for you if you are making these into like high stakes assessments. So if you have a larger class and you want them to annotate frequently, you could think about making this into a low stakes assignment and giving students kind of generic instructions for each annotation assignment. If you have a smaller class and you really want students to develop a specific skill, like reading a, a research article, maybe that will involve more um, 
in a uh, more detailed grading with a rubric or something like that. So it really depends how much time is invested in grading was one of the, the questions in the chat. And that will really depend on how you're implementing it in your course. I'll say in my course, my goals in using hypothesis annotation is to make sure my students are staying engaged in the reading and also to build a community because I teach an asynchronous online course. So the way that um, I grade is just a complete incomplete for my assignments. So I'm really going in, um, I'll look to see how many annotations each student has done, making sure that there's not any questions or like egreg egregious errors in them and marking them complete or incomplete. So it's not as intensive of grading as if I were to be reading a reflection or something like that. Um, so that is really depending on how you have set up your annotations, but we make it easy to filter and look at individual annotations by one student at a time, no matter which learning management system you're in. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can set up your assignments. Um, like I said, my class, my students annotate basically every week. I teach an asynchronous online class with about 25 students. Um, and that is going to impact how my instructions look versus once I worked with a biology professor who annotated um, who has her students just annotating her study guides for her five exams. Um, so how she instructs students is going to look very different from how I instruct my students. I also think that sharing the purpose of why you're having students annotate can be really important for getting students to buy in and participate meaningfully in the conversation. Um, so if I go back I put my slides here. Um, I should have reordered them. If I go back, uh, this is an example from my own syllabus. And my I made a statement about why we're annotating in my syllabus. Um, so in my statement, I reiterate why my annotations are low stakes assignments. I want my students to be able to really learn from the from the annotation assignments. Um, so I try to emphasize the fact that they're allowed to make mistakes in the annotation. It's just a complete incomplete grade so that we can learn together. And then I also want to connect for them explicitly that adding the annotations now will help them later on as they're preparing for their projects um, or maybe in your case, an exam or a paper or something like that. So I think that being explicit with our students can also help increase that buy-in and increase the quality of our annotations because they can see why they're participating in that kind of assignments. So here are some ideas for how you can get started. Um, and these links might be pulled into our chat. I can always pop them in as well. Um, the, my favorite way to start my semester, and my students did this last week, because last week was my first week of classes, is to have students start by annotating the syllabus. So I know someone had asked earlier, um, you know, how can students learn how to use hypothesis? I think this is a great way to kind of get them to practice for the first time without it being the, you know, having the stakes of engaging in like a higher level course reading. It's just the first week of class. If they have questions, they can ask it. Um, they can practice annotating and learn that, get any issues ironed out if they have any. I didn't have any issues last week. Um, and also it gives them a space to go back and review the Q&A later on because those annotations are recorded. Um, so the expectations that we set also um, are that students are going to be um, actively engaging with our course materials from the first day of class. So I know students kind of roll in with this idea that syllabus day is like the day that they just sit and listen, but no, they are engaging with our materials from the first day of class. So I like to always start by setting those expectations with students. And we have sample um, syllabus annotation assignments here. So I'll pop this into the chat for everyone. You can use these instructions in your class or adapt them to whatever um, you know you might need. The other way that I have seen some instructors use hypothesis is to use it as a way to provide guidance for students um, through the texts. So you can go in to the annotations 
um, or go into the text that you load into Hypothesis before you make that assignment available to students um, and add your own annotations and you ask questions of students. You can model annotations if you want to show them a certain type of thinking that is beneficial in that particular text and provide a clarification around specific areas of a text. So I'm just going to open one example I have um, in my course here with a reading that I use in my course. And on this particular reading, I do go in and I add questions for my students before they um, before they are annotating the document. So I am asking them to make some connections here um, that they might not have thought of otherwise. And this can be really helpful. This isn't an example of a research article, but if you're having students do, you know, reading academic research, that can be a challenging thing for a lot of students to tackle. So having adding questions, kind of guiding questions, or maybe even demonstrating to students like the order in which you go about reading an academic article and what to look out for can be helpful in addition to just adding questions for them. So we've linked to here a, um, sorry about that, an academic article annotation assignment as an example. So I'm putting this into the chat as well. However, there are, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I actually want to focus. Someone did ask, is there a way to copy a document that you used in one class into another, including the annotations? Um, so we have a new feature that can help. If you have um, added your own annotations to a document and you want to use those annotations in, to, in another course, in a new semester, um, or in the same course in your current semester, we have a new import export feature that you can use. So some faculty, if you go in and add your own annotations and then you copy the course into a new semester, you can now go to our uh, share button at the top of the annotation sidebar and you can export your annotations. And then you can go into the new course that you've created and then import them there and select the file that has downloaded to your computer. And this works the same for if you would like to use the same annotations across, like maybe you're teaching the same course, different sections in one semester um, that have different course sites. You could download it in your one course site and then go into your other course site, open the share, go to import and import that file and it will connect them for you. So that's a new feature as well. And that link is in, um, is I think I'm not sure. No, it's not. It's not in the Q and A. So I'll pop that into the chat, so you can learn more about that. So that should make it easy if you do want to pre annotate the documents with your own annotations to move those annotations over from semester to semester. Because although you can copy hypothesis assignments in most learning management systems from semester to semester, the annotations won't carry over. In most instances, you don't want things like student annotations carrying over. Um, on the other hand, a lot of times students um, don't need you know, your annotations to have a conversation about the text. In most cases, I just leave the reading open for my students to have a dialogue about it. So I just open the reading for questions, resources, and connections. And my students are the ones that are really starting the conversation. Uh, so this link to instructions um, is very similar to what I use in my own course. Uh, and I think that this can be helpful for giving students a nudge in how to create um, annotations that are meaningful without giving them, kind of pigeon them, pigeonholing them into a specific conversation, right? We don't want to create that boring repetition that we sometimes see in like discussion boards where every student is answering with the same thing. So this can be helpful in giving students some guidance without limiting them. Um, I ask my students to ask a question about something that's unclear and confusing to them. Paraphrase an important phrase or passage in their own words. Find an idea or passage in the text uh, that's something that's based on what they know from other classes or what's based on their own life experiences and to share that. Uh, connect a passage or idea to something they've already learned in class, which can be helpful to see how students are connecting topics throughout the term. 
um, or comments on a passage and explained how it challenged or changed their way of thinking. So I think that this can be really helpful because this asking students to make these kinds of connections, first of all, decenters me as the source of authority in the class. A lot of times we as instructors are seen as like, we're the only source of information. Authors are the source of truth and students don't know how to push back on authors because a lot of times in K to 12 education, they're not taught to push back on those things. So having, asking them to do, uh, you know, add these annotations or ask these questions can help see them, them see themselves as scholars and co-create knowledge together as part of a scholarly community. Again, be explicit with your students about this uh, and how annotations can help them with these things. Uh, so another idea, if you're teaching something that, for example, is more STEM related, um, is to ask students to practice key skills related to problem solving. So we saw some of these examples with the physics textbook that I was looking at earlier. Um, you can have students clarify what the syntax represents or what notation represents in specific instances where it is not spelled out for them. You can have them translate technical passages um, into their own words. So maybe asking them to like, there's a phenomenon on Reddit that's like ELI five, explain it like I'm five. Ask them to take a technical passage and explain it like someone is five. Um, because that can really demonstrate whether or not students have a good handle on the understanding of a topic. And also, they can just locate the required information in a text. So if they're doing something like reading a scholarly article, um, is all of the information there in order to assess whether, you know, a research study was done in, um, in a rigorous way? Is anything missing? Do they look at the data that's provided and see anything that um, is not well explained? And here's just an example of annotation on a uh, data science. I think this example is uh, a data science text and a student is asking you know, for clarification around notation or syntax in one example and then in another, um, you know, I have a student translating a technical passage here into um, into more easily understood terms. And then finally, uh, in a bit, I'm going to talk about what kinds of documents hypothesis works best with. Uh, for the most part, it's going to be documents that you can load into your learning management system and that are freely available for students to use. So if you are using a lot of paywalled content that requires a login, I will suggest to have students annotate course documents like instructions or study guides. Um, so if you can save something as a PDF and load it into your learning management system, you can probably annotate it with Hypothesis. And having students annotate collaboratively on course documents can be a powerful way to get them engaged with course materials. So things like if you save a... Um, if you save your PowerPoint slides as a PDF, you can have students comment on your lecture slides and perhaps make connections from those slides to a paid textbook. Uh, and you can have students do things like um, bring those questions up in class. In my own course, students annotate their project instructions about a week before the project is due. That is great for me because it, first of all, reduces the number of emails that I'm getting last minute with questions about the project because students have to post their questions <laughs> beforehand. Everyone can see each other's questions and answers on the project so they can reference and see what others have been answering and asking. Um, I found that students are more apt to ask clarifying questions in the annotation space. Um, so if I've worded something that's a bit confusing, they will kind of ask for a clarification there where they might not have reached out otherwise. Uh, and it also provides a great reference for me to go back later on and look and see, you know, what? how did I word this? What do people have a lot of questions about? And how can I make this clearer in the future? Um, so a couple of things I want to focus on is uh, that social annotation is an opportunity to best reach all types of learners in the class.
Um, so as I said before, social annotation gives us the opportunity to build a community of knowledge creators. Uh, everyone can see themselves as a scholar uh, and learn how to um, in engage with our course experts, whether it's me or authors of texts, and it gets lots of different folks involved in the conversation uh, in class as well as outside of class. And we've seen a lot of uh, research done around social annotation and self-efficacy and how it can help students see themselves better um, as scholars and as um, people who are boost their confidence, I guess I should say, uh, in their ability to engage with the text. So the research article that is linked uh, here below is a older one about anchoring and class discussions. And what this research article did was they compared um, anchored discussion, and that is anchored discussion to define that, is a discussion that is anchored to a specific area of the text. Like I said, they can link this annotation to a word or a phrase or a sentence in the text. And they compared that kind of conversation to a traditional discussion board. And they found that anchoring conversations better allowed students to clarify specific issues within the text and the ability for students to answer each other's questions and have this kind of conversation increased student confidence, increased their motivation to help their classmates, and their sense of influence on the course conversations. Uh, and we also did a recent case study with undergraduate pharmacy courses with a large research in institution in the Midwest. And they had similar results in this case study. And this is going to be something that's going to be peer reviewed and hopefully published as well. Um, this professor found that in his undergraduate research pharmacy courses, um, that comprehension increased when he used hypothesis specifically. And he also found that it increased student persistence in the sciences to use hypothesis in his classes. Um, so students better saw themselves as scientists, as according to his persistence in the science survey results, and were more likely to continue on. And that case study is linked in the chat. And that is really important for, you know, especially challenging fields, keeping students enrolled and engaged with the course text. So this ability to, you know, better uh, engage our students and help them see themselves as scholars as well can boost their confidence and self-efficacy um, in using hypothesis. If you're having trouble getting students to engage with each other, uh, in hypothesis, it might be helpful to give them guidance on what meaningful engagement looks like. So again, sometimes our students don't know how to do this explicitly. So asking students to respond to classmates using the TAG feedback pro protocol can be helpful. Uh, the TAG feedback protocol, I am apparently not being able to say this word, um, addresses the following things or is structured in the same way. Uh, it gives you some guidance on telling me some things that you like, that's the T, um, and some sentence starters for that, uh, some guidance on how to ask thoughtful questions and how to give suggestions. So this can be really helpful, again, for students to better understand how to have an ongoing and meaningful conversation. Um, and I did notice that someone asked in the chat, and I think that someone may have answered this. If Hypothesis will notify students um, if they have gotten a reply. Um, right now, we, we don't collect student email addresses, so there's no way for us to notify students via email. Um, that is not a possibility. So later, we might be working on the ability for that to happen within the app itself, um, but currently they do not get notifications. So oftentimes I'll ask students to go back into the document and review um, the annotations and replies uh, or incorporate the replies into an activity somehow. Um, another way that hypothesis can help reach all types of learners is because we have multimedia functionality. And Multimedia and multiple means of representation is a key principle in universal design for learning, um, which really, again, 
it promotes incorporating all types of learners into our classrooms. Um, so multimedia options allow students to choose to engage with the text in a very specific way. They can represent how they are interpreting the text by embedding an image or by embedding a video in their annotation. Um, it helps clarify vocabulary and concepts within the text. So if I go back to um, my physics text and I see th this video here, again, I the law of conservation of momentum might not be best uh, represented by text. It's a concept that might be better represented through something like a video. So that multimedia annotation, that multiple means of representation allows us to um, you know, provide that to students. And we also have a new integration with YouTube that allows you to annotate um, transcripts as you watch a video. Show, to show you this very briefly. This is looking at Canvas, but it works the same in all of our learning management systems. When I open a YouTube video annotation, my computer is going a little slow. Uh, basically, I can play the video and the transcript in the center will uh, follow along with the narration. Uh, and students can annotate this transcript as they watch. So again, students have multiple, you have multiple ways of demonstrating course materials through either text or through video, and students can engage with that material in multiple ways as well. Uh, and that ties into encouraging student multimedia in your assignments, asking them to add images, asking them to add videos or links to outside texts. And that can include, you know, being fun and creative with things like asking students to create memes um, and add them to annotations uh, has been a popular one amongst faculty. They can also use emoji to uh, the emoji keyboard to add emoji to annotations. And the last point I want to focus on in this is using social annotation um, with AI in mind, as I know a lot of folks have been concerned about generative AI. Um, in our education spaces as of late. And I think social annotation is a great way to start to critically examine AI with students. So generative AI will sometimes produce information that's incorrect or biased. Can you load something that generative AI has written into your learning management system and have students annotate it and critically look at it together? I actually did this last week as well. And um, the students were Engaging with the chat GPT's text in a pretty meaningful way. Um, so they, you know, noted some weaknesses in the text in addition to uh, noting some strengths in how it wrote. So I think encouraging critical reading through this and um, developing better AI literacy is an opportunity that we have here. Uh, we have some AI starter assignments on here as well. So this link is um, perhaps going to be added into the chat. Um, but I will do that if it's not shortly. Uh, and I'm going to see what kinds of assignments folks have had success with if you um, have used this in your class. Actually, I want to see what kind of ideas. I'm going to change that. I'm going to change my poll. I'm going to see what kinds of ideas do you want to use in your class or do you think might be helpful in your class based on what, what we've talked about today? So you uh, please take my poll again. I think there's maybe one more after this. And I'm going to look at the Q&A because I know that's kind of building up. So I'm going to see what we can answer. So someone asked, what's the ideal number of students annotating one document? Um, I'm going to give the answer everybody hates and say that it depends. Um, I've worked with faculty who annotate with five students, and I've worked with faculty who annotate with over 100 students on one text. Um, I will tell you, my students annotate in my classes about 20 to 25 students. I have all my students annotate together. That works for me. I think if my course were any bigger than 25, I would split them. Um, but I have lots of faculty who tell me that groups of 10 are too big. 
So I think, again, it really will depend on um, what your goals are for using social annotation and what kind of text your students are reading. Um, I will be giving, it looks like some people have some technical questions on how to get their PDFs appropriately linked. Um, so we'll be providing some information on how you can get help um, a little bit later on. But some of these, I don't know if this is the best answer or the best space to answer these questions. Um, so Liz asked, will assigning one text to some groups and another text to other groups still work in Canvas? Um, so that some groups annotate each reading rather than everyone. So we have group functionality where small groups can annotate one reading, or you can create multiple readings and assign each of those readings to um, different groups. So if you want different groups to create uh, to read different readings, you'll want to create separate readings for those. And that would be true in any learning management system and not just Canvas. But please, again, reach out to some contacts we have a little bit later on if that does not answer a question. Can students who come to class do this on their phones? Is the interface phone friendly? So if you do want students to annotate during class, um, I would use the their uh, actual app for their learning management system rather than trying to log in on the browser. Uh, we do work with the app. I wouldn't say it's the most user-friendly experience. I typically recommend that folks are doing this on their browser and not necessarily on um, the app. So I would kind of keep that in mind as well, just because the, the screen real estate is really limited on the phone. So it's hard to read and annotate at the same time. Um, for annotating YouTube videos, does this require the video to have the same subtitles added or does it allow for auto-generated? You, it will pull whatever transcript is being used in YouTube. So if there's a caption that or subtitles that are generated automatically in YouTube, it will pull that. Um, I would review the subtitles because sometimes those can have a lot of errors. Um, so that's something you definitely want to review. At this time, we cannot use videos without subtitles. Um, so do keep that in mind too, but hopefully in the future. Um, so I want to go over really quickly what kinds of documents you can use with Hypothesis Social Annotation to address one of the questions um, from earlier. So what exactly can you annotate with Hypothesis? I mentioned that you can annotate mostly things that can be loaded into your learning management system that are freely available to students. So PDFs are the primary document that most folks are annotating. But if there's a publicly available website, you can also have uh, students annotate anything that is not paywalled. So if there's no login or paywall associated with it, students can annotate it. The one exception that we would have for this is our JSTOR and Vital Source integrations. Um, so if you're a Vital Source school, you may be able to have a student a student annotate a paid eTux through Vital Source, and you can also have students annotate JSTOR articles. Um, and then YouTube video transcripts additionally are our newest kind of annotated document. I guess I should say document because it's not really a document, but PDFs, open textbooks are the most common way of doing things. And what can you put in an annotation? So the things that you can put in an annotation, as I mentioned earlier, are wider than just text. Um, you can add images and videos embedded within the annotations. Students can use LaTeX or you as the instructor can use LaTeX to add equations and external links and tags as well. So again, Hypothesis offers the ability to make the document a living kind of multimedia document instead of just being a text document and help lots of different types of learners better understand that content through the media. Um, I do want to note very quickly that PDFs do have to have a selectable text layer in order to be used with Hypothesis. Basically, that means that if you open a PDF on your computer, you need to be able to copy and paste um, content from one document into another, um, or from that document that you want to use with Hypothesis into another. And if that is not possible, I would check out this link um, that I'll pop into the chat on how you can fix the PDF. So that's just an accessibility concern to be aware of in general. 
Uh, we also have lots of getting started pages if you're not sure how to use Hypothesis with your learning management system. Uh, so that can help you learn how to set up a Hypothesis enabled reading uh, in your learning management system. So someone asked in the chat, do they have an account? Where do you see the Hypothesis icon on a document? Uh, it's you don't need a separate account when you're using a learning management system. It's integrated within. The web application is separate. Um, so I would reference our getting started uh, documents to see how to get started with that. Um, and our starter assignments that I shared earlier with instructions, um, those are all linked here. If you need any ideas for how you might prompt students on how to annotate, you can use those in the course. Uh, so I want to see, um, with one last poll, what you all still need assistance with. I know there's still some Q&A things that are not answered yet, so I'll go through that for one last time as we look at this poll and wrap up today. Um, so what do you still need assistance with is the final poll. And then um, the student, or if you need assistance with getting help, um, our support team, oh, sorry about that. I didn't mean to go forward in the slides. Um, our support team can help you get a hypothesis assignment set up if you're not sure how to do that. Um, so I'm putting that in the uh, chat. Um, and um, they can help you with guiding the students as well. And if you have a specific question uh, regarding um, how to use it in a learning management system, I would reach out to them as well. So someone asked me, can you say more about how you do how you incorporate hypothesis discussions back into other assignments or feedback mechanisms? So in my case, I have students, um, just to kind of go into this a little bit, I have students um, hand in a process reflection with their projects. They have to talk about like what went well and what didn't go well in this project, like what would I have changed in the future, things like that. And I'll also ask them to reference their classmates' annotations and replies and how those annotations have changed their way of thinking or how they impacted their project. So I try to tie in the annotations into um, their writing assignments that they're doing because I think it helps the students reflect on those conversations and also it kind of AI proofs the assignments a little bit as well. So that was a good question. Um, thanks everyone for joining. I know we still, we have about two minutes left, so I'm just going to wrap up a couple other things um, that you can have access to if you are a hypothesis partner. So Hypothesis Academy is a um, asynchronous course that can help you take a deeper dive in a hypothesis. So some of the things we talked about today with getting your assignment set up, you can learn through Hypothesis Academy and get my guidance on. Um, so you can register for Hypothesis Academy using the link provided in the chat. And that is available at no cost to you if you are a partner institution. Um, if you're not yet a partner institution with Hypothesis, we can have someone reach out to you to learn about that. We also offer weekly partner workshops to uh, our partners again. So every week uh, we offer different topics like grading and feedback for social annotation might be a good one if you're interested in learning more about how much time grading takes up, uh, annotate your syllabus, lots of different things we talk about each week. So check those out at the link in the chat. And then we're also having a, a webinar next week, um, Thursday. Oh my God, is next week, February 1st already? Oh. Okay, anyway, Thursday, February 1st at 1 p.m. Eastern, we are going to talk about social annotation in large classrooms specifically. So I'll be back then. Um, and we are also offering, for those of you who are not currently Hypothesis partners, uh, we are offering a spring starter package uh, where, and you can learn more about that in the chat as well. So if you would like to start using Hypothesis at your institution, um, then you can reach out to the email or reach out using the link on the chat. If you have any questions that were not addressed in your um, 
in the Q&A today, again, a lot of the technical questions weren't necessarily like this is not the best place to answer them. Please feel free to reach out to Success at Hypothesis, um, the email that's on the screen, or I'll pop that into the chat as well. Uh, so please reach out if you are having technical or technical difficulties with Hypothesis. We would be happy to assist you um, or get you started. But I know we just hit the hour, so I just want to thank everyone again for taking the time to join us today. And I wish everyone uh, best of luck in the start of your terms. Uh, I hope your students are more engaged with Hypothesis. So thanks again, everyone. I really appreciate your time.